The other part of the cardiovascular system we need to explore are the blood vessels. After completing this section, you should be able to describe the structure and function of arteries, veins, and capillaries. List the major arteries and veins of the body and tell the areas of the body they serve in general. Define pulse and list the common pulse points. Describe how blood pressure is measured. Describe the factors that regulate blood pressure. Discuss the mechanisms for capillary exchange. And describe homeostatic imbalances involving blood vessels and blood circulation. There are three types of blood vessels. Arteries that take blood away from the heart and as they get further and further from the heart, they get smaller and smaller and we call them arterioles. And then we have capillaries, which are arranged in capillary beds. Now it is actually in the capillaries that we exchange material between the blood and the tissues. Then to return blood to the heart, we have the veins. Now the veins start out as small vessels called venules, get into larger structures called veins, and ultimately these return blood to the heart. The blood vessel has three major walls. The lumen is what we call the central opening, the place where the blood flows. The most internal of the layers of the blood vessel is the tunica intima, and this is a single layer of endothelium, that is simple squamous epithelium, whose sole function is to reduce friction, much like the endocardium of the heart reduced friction. This is kind of an extension of that. The tunica media is the middle layer. Now this is composed of smooth muscle that is arranged circularly around the blood vessel. In various blood vessels there are sheets of elastin to make them more stretchy. The muscle activity of the blood vessel is regulated by the vasomotor nerves of the sympathetic nervous system. When the muscles contract, you have vasoconstriction, narrowing the lumen. And when the muscles are not signaled, you have vasodilation, when the muscles are relaxed and the lumen opens up. And the outermost layer of the blood vessel is the tunica externa. This is connective tissue, and there's a lot of loosely woven collagen in this connective tissue. This helps protect the blood vessel and also anchors it in place. So if we look at arteries, the tunica intima is the internal layer, that single layer of epithelium. Then we have a rather thick tunica media, and we have the tunica externa. Arteries need to be nice and stretchy, which is why there's usually some elastic fibers in with the muscles. Arteries are the closest to the heart, so the pressure from the heart is going to be greatest in the artery, and that's why we need to have kind of like pressure hosing here. The veins have a tunica intima that has been modified to have valves in it. Much like the valves in the heart prevented backflow, that's what happens with the veins. The tunica media is much thinner, and of course the tunica externa is about the same. By the time blood gets to the veins, most of the pressure has dissipated, so there's not a lot of pressure in veins, and that's why we don't need very thick muscle walls there. And the valves help prevent backflow so that the blood continues to flow in one direction, back to the heart. Most of your blood has to fight gravity to get back to the heart. The heart's fairly high up in the body, and so there are some things that assist, since the pressure is kind of gone from behind the blood, and one is your respiratory pump. When you breathe deeply and you change the shape of your thoracic cavity, that helps to almost act like a straw sucking blood up into the vena cava. So that deep breathing helps return blood back to the heart. The other thing that helps is skeletal muscle activity. Now the way skeletal muscles work is you've got this muscular pump. Most of the veins run fairly deep and so there are skeletal muscles around them. When the muscles contract and bulge, they push in on the veins and that squishes the blood upward. And the reason it goes in one direction is because when you squish here in the middle, the valves close if blood tries to flow backwards and the blood is pushed on up. 
The capillaries are composed only of a tunica intima. Now this epithelium does have to sit on a basement membrane, so there's a little bit of matrix there that it sits on. The capillaries come off of an arteriole and they make this interweaving, what we call the capillary beds. This makes sure that blood flows pretty much directly to every single cell in your body. We call the blood flow in the capillaries the microcirculation. And there are two types of blood vessels in the capillary bed. One is what we call the vascular shunt or the thoroughfare shunt, which is pretty much a direct connection between the arteriole and the venule. And then the other vessels are the true capillaries, these little network things that come off of that thoroughfare shunt. So here you see the whole system. Blood flows away from the heart and the arteries. They have a lot of pressure they have to withstand. They flow out of the arteries. The arteries get smaller and smaller to arterioles into a capillary bed. Because this is where the exchange is going to occur, we just have one cell layer we have to move material through. Then the capillaries drain into venules, which drain into veins, which return blood back to the heart. Capillary beds are where the nutrient and gas exchange occurs, and most tissues have a very rich supply of capillaries. There are a few that don't, like cartilage does not have a good blood supply, ligaments do not have a good blood supply. That thoroughfare shunt, remember, is the channel that connects the arteriole to the venule. And off of that, there are 10 to 100 true capillaries that branch that go into the tissues. In order to determine whether the blood flows into the true capillaries or not, we have sphincter muscles that help control that blood flow to the capillary bed. Now, here's where the sphincter muscles are arranged. And if you have a very active tissue, a metabolically active tissue, then these muscles are going to be relaxed so that as blood comes into this thoroughfare channel, it will be able to flow into the capillaries and take nutrition to the cells. If, however, the tissue is not very active at the moment, these sphincters will be closed, directing blood pretty much straight through, not sending a lot of blood into the capillary bed proper so that the cells are nourished. Examples of this, you're out running a marathon, your gastrocnemius muscle is going to look like this. You're home watching television with your feet propped up, your gastrocnemius muscle is going to look more like this. So that blood is directed to where it's needed the most. In the venous system, there are some problems that can occur. A common one is varicose veins. People who stand or sit a lot have blood pooling in their feet and legs. Remember that muscular pump helps return blood through the venous system. As the blood sits on top of those valves, the valves eventually get damaged and then the, valve, the veins become kind of twisted and that's when they show up. It's varicose veins occur in what are called your superficial veins. Uh, you may have been told that you shouldn't cross your legs because that causes varicose veins and that's not true. If you want to avoid varicose, varicose veins, be as active as you can. Walk a lot. Don't stand, don't sit, don't stay too stationary during the day. Thrombophlebitis is a complication of varicose veins. Those valves, when they break down, are no longer nice and smooth. And platelets don't like rough spots. So anytime there's a rough spot inside the circulatory system, the platelets tend to gather and cause a clot to form. If the clot breaks free, you may have a pulmonary embolism. And the reason the clot ends up in the pulmonary system is pretty simple, if you think about it. As blood is traveling in your veins, from your legs, say, it's going to go into bigger and bigger and bigger vessels, so the clot won't be a problem. It's going to go through the right side of your heart without being a problem. A clot would have to be massive to block anything in the heart. As it goes out the pulmonary trunk and goes to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs, it's going to start going into smaller and smaller and smaller blood vessels. And eventually it will find a vessel so small that it will block the blood flow in it. Pulmonary emboli can be life-threatening. All right, let's see where you are. The vessel layer that controls the diameter of an artery would be the tunica externa, tunica intima, tunica media, or all of the above. Okay, remember it's that muscular layer, that's the tunica media. 
Which of the following structures have valves? Arteries, veins, capillaries, or none of the above? It's the veins. They have valves to prevent backflow. All right, you remember that the heart acts as a double pump and both pumps act in unison at the same time. An oxygenated blood returns to the heart through the venous system and the right side pumps the blood to the lungs. Then the oxygenated blood returns to the heart through the pulmonary veins to the left side and the left side pumps to the body. So that you have the pulmonary circuit, the right side pumps the pulmonary circuit to the lungs to exchange gases, the left side pumps the systemic circuit to the body, again to exchange gases, this time oxygen for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide blood, rich blood comes back to the right side of the heart, we pump it to the lungs and the pulmonary circuit, gets oxygenated, that oxygenated blood is pumped to the tissues of the body in the systemic circuit. Let's look at the major arteries of the systemic system. The aorta is the largest of the arteries. It originates from the left ventricle. The ascending aorta is a short piece of the aorta that travels upward, and the right and left coronary arteries come off of that. You'll remember that they supply blood to the heart muscle itself. Then there's the aortic arch, where the uh, aorta turns back toward the back of the body and then descends downward. The carotid arteries, which go to the head and the neck, come off of the aortic arch, and the subclavian arteries that serve the arms come off of the aortic arch. The aorta travels down through the thoracic cavity. That's called the thoracic aorta. When it passes through the uh, diaphragm, it's called the abdominal aorta. The celiac trunk and the mesenteric arteries are the arteries that feed the digestive organs. The renal arteries go to the kidney, the gonadal arteries go to the gonads, and the iliac arteries split off the bottom to feed the pelvis and go to the legs. And of course, there are smaller branches of all of these. So if we look at the arterial system, here is the aorta. There's the ascending aorta, and the coronary arteries come off of that. The aortic arch, there are your carotids going to the head and your subclavians going to the arms, and they're going to turn into the radial ulnar, uh, brachial radial ulnar arteries. As the artery aorta turns downward, we have the descending aorta, the thoracic up here. There's some small arteries that come off of that to feed the muscles of the ribs. And then we come down, and we're going to have the celiac artery, the superior and inferior mesenteric artery, and the renal arteries. The aorta branches here at the bottom into the iliac arteries, and as we go down into the legs, you've got the femoral artery and the popliteal artery and so on. The venous system has a few more blood vessels in it and contains about 65% of the blood volume, so the blood is not evenly spit, split between the arteries and the veins. There are two types of veins. There are deep veins that are pretty much parallel to the arteries, held very close to the arteries, and usually have the same name as the arteries. Then there are some veins that are superficial. These are the veins that are visible in your arms and your legs. The, all of the veins converge to form the vena cava. Now the superficial veins and the deep veins are interconnected, so blood could be in a deep vein and then be in a superficial vein and then be in a deep vein. Just go back and forth. And the veins all come together someplace to form either the inferior or superior vena cava. So that the vena cava is what's going to enter the right atrium, and there's the superior vena cava. And the superior vena cava is going to drain blood from the head and the neck and the arms. So the jugular vein is the one that parallels the carotid artery. We've got subclavian veins, and the subclavian veins and the jugular veins merge to make brachiocephalic veins, and the brachiocephalic veins merge to make the superior vena cava. Some of the superficial veins of the arms are the cephalic, the basilic, and the median cubital. These are the ones that are in your arm, the median cubital being the most popular one for venipuncture to draw blood. The inferior vena cava is going to drain the blood from the lower body. 
The common iliac veins come from the legs and the pelvic region. You have gonadal veins that come from the gonads and renal veins that come from the kidneys. Now there's a special circulatory system that involves the digestive system that we'll talk about shortly. The hepatic veins are the ones that come from the liver. You have superficial veins in your leg as well. The longest one in the leg is the great saphenous vein. So as we look here, you've got your jugular veins coming from the head, your subclavian veins coming from the arm, and of course there are radial and ulnar veins and brachial veins and so forth. They come together to make that brachiocephalic, which makes the superior vena cava. The superficial veins, you've got that basilic vein, cephalic vein, and here's that median cubital vein. Now notice that all of the veins do eventually merge. So the fact that some are superficial and some are deep doesn't mean those are two separate circulatory systems. Here is that great saphenous vein in the leg. This vein, because it is not necessary for circulation, is a vein that's likely to become varicose and they can remove it without compromising circulation in the leg. They also sometimes harvest this vein if they're doing bypasses on the heart. This is where they get the extra blood vessel they need for those bypasses. Then you have your femorals, your iliacs that come back. Notice that there are not any veins that are directly coming from the digestive organs. There's a little indirect thing we're going to talk about here. Here are the renal veins and here's the hepatic vein. And all of these drain into the inferior vena cava which drains back into the right atrium. There are some special circulations in the body and one of them is the circle of Willis which is a special anastomosis of arteries that feed the brain. This is a circle of blood vessels at the base of the brain that surrounds the pituitary gland and the optic chiasma. It's formed by several blood vessels that feed the brain, the internal carotids, anterior communicating artery, and posterior communicating artery. What it does is it makes sure that there's always a blood supply to the brain. The brain needs a high supply of oxygen. Even a short amount of time without oxygen to the brain can cause brain damage. And so we have guaranteed that should something happen to one of these blood vessels, we still have a way to get blood to any part of the brain using this circle of Willis to feed these blood vessels. Something gets damaged here, we can still sneak around and get blood someplace else. The fetus has a separate circulatory system from the mother. In the fetus, the lungs and the digestive organs are not functional and they don't have to be because nutrients and oxygen from the mother are coming through the placenta into the fetal circulation. There is one umbilical vein and it's the one that's carrying the nutrient and oxygen rich blood to the fetus and there are two umbilical arteries that carry the waste products away from the fetus to the placenta. Most of the blood from the umbilical vein travels directly to the right atrium in a blood vessel in the fetus called the ductus venosus. Much of the blood that comes into the right atrium, instead of going to the right ventricle, goes through a hole in the heart called the foramen ovale over to the left atrium. Remember, the right side pumps to the lungs and we don't really need to send blood to the lungs for gas exchange because this is already oxygenated blood. Some blood does travel into the right ventricle and is passed into the pulmonary trunk. Again, we have another bypass. We have a connector between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk called the ductus arteriosus, and we shunt a lot of blood to the aorta. Now, some blood does travel in the pulmonary circuit, just enough to make sure that the blood vessels are developing properly, but there is no reason for that blood to travel in the pulmonary circuit. So here we see the placenta and the umbilical vein and the two umbilical arteries. So blood travels, goes through the umbilicus, and this is that uh, ductus venosus that goes straight here to the right atrium. Blood is going to go through the hole in the heart, the foramen ovale, over to the right, to the left atrium to get into the aorta. A little bit of blood will get into the 
right ventricle and into the pulmonary trunk. Some of it will travel to the lungs just to make sure blood vessels are developing, but a lot of it will go through that ductus arteriosus into the aorta again. Then the aorta carries the blood through all of the blood vessels of the fetus, which are the same blood vessels that you have, and the umbilical arteries come off of the iliac arteries and travel back to the placenta. At birth, the fetal circulation is going to change. The foramen ovale closes, usually within a few hours of birth, and you have a little depression uh, on the wall of the atria called the fossa ovalis. The ductus arteriosus between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta also spasms close and becomes a little bit of fibrous tissue called the ligamentum arteriosum. The ductus venosus, almost as soon as blood stops flowing from the uh, uh, placenta through the umbilical vein, th this spasms down and becomes the ligamentum venosum which helps hold the liver in place. And the umbilical arteries also, once the umbilical cord has been cut, spasm closed, and they become ligaments. Some of them help support the liver, and some of them help support the umbilicus. The third special circulation we need to talk about is the hepatic portal circulation. Blood from the digestive organs is nutrient rich. And we don't want these big spikes in nutrients in the blood. We rather like to keep the blood kind of status quo in terms of amino acid levels and carbohydrate levels and those kinds of things. So what we do is we take the blood that's being coming from the digestive organs and we send it to the liver. And the liver takes care of storing nutrients if we have excesses or we can pull nutrients out of storage in the liver to put into the blood so that we keep homeostasis of all of those nutrients. The arteries that feed the digestive organs were the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. We collect from those digestive organs in veins of the hepatic portal system, and instead of putting it right back into the vena cava, we send it to the liver. Now, in the liver, the blood is processed. There was a hepatic artery that took blood to the uh, liver to feed the liver, to nourish the liver and that blood and this blood from the hepatic portal system all gets mingled together and the hepatic vein returns blood to the inferior vena cava. So here you see the hepatic portal system. There is um, the splenic vein from the spleen and the gastric vein from the stomach and your inferior and superior mesenteric veins and they all come together to make this hepatic portal vein which goes into the liver. The liver does its job of processing, the blood goes in the hepatic vein, which goes back into the vena cava. It's important that we keep up and make sure the circulation is being efficient, and there are a couple of ways we can do this. One is by taking a pulse, the other is by taking blood pressure. A pulse is simply the expansion and recoil of an artery as the heart pumps and then relaxes, pumps and then relaxes. The blood is pushed and then it kind of isn't pushed and then it's pushed and then it isn't pushed. And you can feel this little expansion and recoil if you can get an artery close to the surface and against a firm place. So you've got to have a firm structure underneath and it has to be fairly close to the surface. Each pulse represents a heartbeat. Now there are several pulse pressure points. There's one here in the head, the temporal artery. The facial artery is under the jaw. The carotid artery here in your neck is a pretty common one. The brachial artery is not a great place to palpate a pulse, but the radial artery is. The femoral artery here at the bend of the leg. There's a popliteal artery behind the knee. There's a posterior tibial artery right there on the inner ankle. And across the top of the foot is the dorsalis pedis artery and you can palpate a pulse pretty much at any of these points, some a little easier than others. Blood pressure is the other way we can monitor this. Now blood is going to flow along a pressure gradient. It flows from high pressure to low pressure. So the highest pressure has to be the ventricles and the lowest pressure has to be the atria because that's the only way blood would flow back to the atria. The heart is what generates that pressure, what keeps the blood flowing but there is resistance to the blood flowing through the blood vessels and that is what 
uh, gives us our blood pressure. The closer to the pump you are, the higher the pressure. So in arteries, the pressure is high. In veins, the pressure is low. In order to measure blood pressure, we use the auscultory method. That is, we listen. It's an indirect method. You use a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope. Now, sphygmomanometer is the big, fancy word for blood pressure cuff. What you do is you use the blood pressure cuff, you put it on the upper arm, and you pump it up so that you completely compress the brachial artery. No blood is getting through. Then you begin to release the pressure, and you listen for sounds of blood flow in the artery. These sounds are called Karotkov sounds. So that your brachial artery is here, and you're going to put the cuff on and pump it up and close it off completely. As you release the pump, blood starts to flow through and you begin to hear the Karotkov sounds. And the first time you hear a sound, that pressure is the first time the pressure was great enough to overcome the pressure on the cuff. So that's your systolic pressure. That's the high pressure. You read that. Then you continue to release the pressure and when you completely open up the artery, there's no resistance to the blood flow as a result of the pressure cuff and you stop hearing sounds and that last sound reflects your diastolic pressure. Now there are several factors that control blood pressure. One is your cardiac output and you'll remember your cardiac output had to do with venous return and with various neural and hormonal controls on heart rate. You also have peripheral resistance. Peripheral resistance is uh, impeding flow of blood through the blood vessels. And then finally, there's blood volume. Now, all three of these interact to maintain a normal blood pressure. In a healthy individual, blood volume is pretty constant and cardiac output is pretty constant. So in a healthy individual, if we are trying to fiddle around with blood pressure, peripheral resistance is what we use. So peripheral resistance can be controlled through your nervous system. You'll remember that the vasomotor nerves of the sympathetic system go to those muscles in the blood vessels so that uh, when those are activated, you have vasoconstriction. Then you have renal factors. The kidneys rely on blood pressure. So if blood pressure goes low, the, there are some cells in the kidney that are endocrine cells. They secrete renin. And what renin does is it starts a chain reaction of converting a protein in your blood called angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 does two things. First of all, it will vasoconstrict a little bit and that will elevate the blood, vest, the blood pressure. But it also causes the release of aldosterone. And you'll remember aldosterone is the hormone that makes you save sodium. So when you save sodium, it ends up back in your blood Water follows sodium, so you end up with an increased blood volume, and if you've got an increased blood volume, you're going to have an increased blood pressure. Some other things that control peripheral resistance include temperature. When you're cold, your blood vessels vasoconstrict. That's to keep the blood deep in your core to conserve heat. When you're hot, your blood vessels vasodilate so that blood flows to the surface of your body and that heat can dissipate some. Chemicals have an effect on peripheral resistance. Epinephrine will vasoconstrict. It increases heart rate and blood pressure. Nicotine vasoconstricts. People who smoke are more susceptible to heart attacks, partially because at any given time you might have a tiny clot circulating in your body, but as long as your blood vessels are fairly wide open, it's not going to be a problem. But if you smoke and vasoconstrict, then a tiny clot may cause a problem that it would not have otherwise. And alcohol is a vasodilator. You may have heard of alcoholics uh, succumbing to hypothermia on fairly warm nights. I mean, not freezing, freezing cold, but it's 45 degrees or so, and they're found dead from hypothermia. This is because they get drunk, they pass out, they are not conscious enough to cover up or seek any kind of... Uh, shelter, and because of the vasodilation, they dissipate heat from their body at a much more rapid rate than they would otherwise. Diet may play a role in blood pressure. There is some controversy. 
uh, diets low in sodium, low in fat, and low in cholesterol seem to be better for you in general and may help you with blood pressure. Uh, so they, most people say that this kind of diet helps prevent hypertension. Your systolic pressure should be between 100 and 140 millimeters of mercury. Diastolic pressure should fall between 60 and 90 millimeters of mercury. We typically say that a normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, pretty much split the difference there. Now your blood pressure will vary with gender. Uh, women tend to have slightly higher blood pressures than men. If you're a little heavy, your high blood pressure will be a little higher. Uh, blacks are more likely to have hypertension than any other race. Uh, poor people are more likely to have hypertension. Uh, if you're in a bad mood, if you're excited, blood pressure activity. Uh, certainly when you're undergoing physical activity you'll have a little elevation in blood pressure but again kind of like with your heart if you are physically active and you have exercised your heart you're also exercising those blood vessel muscles a little bit. And posture. When you're laying flat your blood pressure is lowest. When you're standing up your blood pressure is at its highest. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Now, if you run a low end of normal blood pressure, that's an indicator of a long life. There's something called orthostatic hypotension, you'll remember. This is when your blood pressure drops a little bit when you stand up, and this is because there's a little pooling of blood in your extremities. You feel a little lightheaded or dizzy when you go from lying down to sitting suddenly or sitting to standing suddenly. This is because of a little error in your sympathetic system. Uh, the vasoconstriction that the sympathetic system should do when you stand up is a little too slow and so it takes a while for it to catch up. Chronic hypotension is usually due to redu reduced blood viscosity. Now you need blood cells and you need protein in your blood to make it viscous, make it kind of sticky. So people who have poor nutrition may be anemic or have reduced blood protein, they're likely to have chronic hypotension. Acute hypotension, on the other hand, is the kind that comes on very suddenly, and this typically reflects blood loss, what we call circulatory shock. Now, people who have just undergone surgery or are undergoing surgery, they may bleed heavily, in which case their blood pressure may drop dramatically and rapidly, so this is a real threat to people undergoing surgery and those who have just come out and are in, in intensive care. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Now brief elevations of blood pressure are a normal response to fever and exercise and emotional conditions, but when you have sustained chronic hypertension, you have a problem. There are no real symptoms that go with chronic hypertension until it's pretty well far advanced, so this is why it's sometimes called the silent killer. When you have high blood pressure, your heart has to work harder to pump blood. The blood pressure in the vessels attached to the heart has to be overcome in order to squeeze blood through the semilunar valves. This is something called afterload. So the higher the pressure is in the blood vessels, the harder your heart has to work to force open the semilunar valves to get the blood into the blood vessels. Chronic hypertension can lead to heart failure, vascular disease, renal failure, and stroke. Uh, heart failure because of the stress you put on the heart. Vascular disease because the higher blood pressure tends to make tears in the endothelium that uh, makes scar tissue develop in the blood vessels leading to atherosclerosis. The blood vessels, the capillaries in the kidney and the brain are very delicate and fragile and so hypertension tends to damage those and when you damage the ones in the kidney you can have renal failure over the course of time and of course a bleed in the brain would lead to a stroke. About 90% of our chronic hypertension is primary hypertension. That is, that's the disease. We have no underlying cause that we can say is causing it. Some things that contribute may be your diet. Diets low in calcium, potassium, and magnesium, and high in sodium and fat certainly appear to contribute to the development of hypertension. 
people who are obese are much more likely to be hypertensive than people who are a more normal weight. However, not all obese people are hypertensive. Usually, hypertension occurs after the age of 40. As I said earlier, it is more common in blacks. As a matter of fact, at Meharry Hospital, they've been doing research for some time on hypertension, and they believe they have found a protein in the blood vessel walls of people who are black that may contribute to the, the cause of hypertension. It does tend to run in families. If you have a parent who has hypertension, you're a little more likely to develop it. Stress plays a role, and smoking definitely plays a role. Now, some of these things you can't control. I mean, you inherit what you inherit from your parents. That's just it. Uh, you are who you are racially. You're going to get older. But some of these are life choices. You can control your diet. You can control your weight. You can do things to help control stress, and you can choose not to smoke. So certainly, as you get older, if you have that family history or if you've got a racial inclination toward hypertension, these other things are some things that you can try to do to maybe prolong your getting hypertension, maybe prevent it altogether. Secondary hypertension is the result of about 10% of the hypertension we have. And this kind of hypertension, we have an identifiable disorder. Uh, kidney disease can cause uh, hypertension, Cushing syndrome, and hyperthyroidism can cause hypertension. If you treat the primary disorder, if you take care of the hyperthyroidism or the Cushing's or the kidney disease, then the hypertension typically goes away. All right, the capillaries are where we're going to exchange nutrients. The tissues are bathed in that interstitial fluid. That's the nutrient soup around the tissue. And the materials have to flow between the plasma and this interstitial fluid. So we need to get nutrients from the plasma to the interstitial fluid, waste products from the interstitial fluid to the plasma. Oxygen and carbon dioxide have to exchange as well. Now, lipid-soluble items can just diffuse right through all of the cell membranes and just get right in. Some things that are fairly large molecules may be transported by vesicles through the endothelial cells into, from the plasma into the interstitial fluid. Some things ooze through the intercellular clefts, the spaces between the blood vessels of the capillaries. And some capillaries are fenestrated capillaries, that is the cells, the epithelial cells of the capillary actually have tiny little holes in them that facilitate the movement of fluid from the plasma to the interstitial space and vice versa. Now this is a little peek at a capillary. Here's that basement membrane and this is that single cell. And the cells are held together in spots by tight junctions, but then there are gaps between the cells where we don't have tight junctions. And these are the intercellular clefts, and this can be a point where fluid can leak into or out of the blood vessel. And this happens to be one of the really permeable capillaries we're looking at, where there are fenestrations or windows. There are little holes actually go through, all the way through the epithelial cell to allow exchange of fluid back and forth between the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid. So just to look at the four ways we have here. We've got diffusion through the intercellular clefts. We've got direct diffusion of lipid soluble materials. We have diffusion through fenestrations. And we have this vesicular transport where we actually pick up something by endocytosis transport it across the cell and dump it out by exocytosis. Or it could go in the other way, endocytosis across the cell and exocytosis. Now, a lot of fluid has to move in the capillary bed area. That interstitial fluid and plasma has to exchange quite a bit. And the driving force behind this is various kinds of pressure. On the arterial end of the capillary bed, there's a fairly high blood pressure, and that, that's a water pressure, a hydrostatic pressure. So that helps force fluids out of 
the capillary into the interstitial fluid through those fenestrations and those intercellular clefts. But as water leaves the blood, all that's left behind are the cells and the proteins. Proteins typically do not get through here because the um, gaps in the clefts are not large enough to let proteins through. So the proteins stay behind and they start making kind of an osmotic pull for water to come back in. That is, the fluid in the blood vessel gets kind of concentrated and re you'll remember Mother Nature doesn't like that so she moves water to take care of that. So that by the time we get to the venous end of the capillary bed, we've got an osmotic pressure that's higher in the capillary than outside the capillary. And that tends to pull the fluid, the water, back in. Now, why we're worried about water is remember all this stuff is dissolved in water. So the nutrients dissolved in the water gets pushed out and then the waste products that are dissolved in the interstitial water gets pulled back in. That's how we make that exchange. However, it's not a complete exchange. Some of the fluid remains in the tissues, not all of it returns back to the blood and it becomes lymph. And that lymph has to be collected by the lymphatic system and returned to the blood through another mechanism. So if this is our arteriole and this is our capillary bed and here's our venule over here, as we come into the system, we've got a higher hydrostatic pressure here. Don't worry about these numbers, they're just trying to show you that there's a lot of hydrostatic pressure, not a lot of uh, oncotic pressure here, osmotic pressure here. So overall, we have more pressure to push stuff out than we have to suck stuff back in. So the hydrostatic pressure pushes on this end. But by the time we get down here, we've lost some of that fluid. That means we have less hydrostatic pressure and because we've kind of concentrated the proteins, that os uh, osmotic pressure is now greater than the hydrostatic pressure, so that increased osmotic pressure sucks the fluid back in. So nutrient-rich fluid is pushed out, bathes across the cells, there's diffusion and exchange between the cells, we get a concentration of metabolic wastes, and as we suck the fluid back in, those metabolic wastes now go into the bloodstream. So we have effectively exchanged materials between the blood and the tissue. Congenital heart defects are one of the developmental defects of the heart. About half of our congenital defect deaths are because of congenital heart defects. These are because of structural abnormalities in the heart. Sometimes the blood vessels don't connect like they're supposed to. Sometimes some of those holes in the heart and, and vessels don't constrict like they're supposed to after birth. The heart forms in the first trimester. Now some women don't even know they're pregnant until they're well through, almost through that first trimester. They're two months along before they realize that they're pregnant. Because they are not aware that they're pregnant, they may not be careful about things like smoking or taking antibiotics or ingesting other drugs. And any of these can have an effect on the developing fetus and the developing heart. The heart typically functions well for a long lifetime, particularly if you take just a little bit of care of it. Some of the other vascular system diseases associated with aging are varicose veins. The, the longer you live, the more opportunity you've had to have that blood pooling in your blood vessels and the more likely you are to have had increased varicose veins. Again, exercise, even just plain walking, helps diminish your risk for this. Atherosclerosis is when the walls of the blood vessels become less stretchy and less elastic. A little bit of this happens as you age no matter what. Remember, elastic tissue just doesn't replace as effectively as you get older, and so you get a little less and a little less elastic tissue. But again, hypertension will accelerate atherosclerosis, so trying to avoid high blood pressure is a way to help forestall this. And hypertension does tend to occur as you get older. No one's really sure why. It may be a combination of a, a buildup of diet and some other features, and it, some of that's that genetic predisposition. Atherosclerosis is a degenerative process. It does happen with aging and it is a result of the loss of arterial elasticity. 
Atherosclerosis is what contributes to hypertension. It also contributes to the slow failure of a number of other organs. With atherosclerosis, you do not have the same circulation you have, so organs get a little less blood and a little less blood, and that begins to damage them. Coronary artery disease is when you have deposits on the arterial walls of the coronary arteries. Now, again, cholesterol plaques and things like that that deposit on your arterial walls are not smooth, and so the platelets tend to take these rough spots and try to cover them up and make them smooth again so that you get thrombi forming and they can either totally occlude, just the clot itself, stationary can totally occlude the blood vessel, or it can break free and travel to a smaller spot on the blood vessel causing blockage. Whenever a blood vessel is blocked, blood does not get through to the cells on the other side, and some of these cells are highly oxygen dependent, like the ones in the heart and the ones in the brain, so clots in those places particularly do a lot of damage. We have so much technology in the world, isn't it just wonderful? But it has a very negative impact on vascular health. In this country, we tend to have a high protein, high fat diet, which contributes to plaque formation on the blood vessels. And we have a number of labor saving devices. Quite frankly, if we didn't occasionally lose the remote control at my house, I'm not sure my husband would ever get any exercise. Also, our jobs tend to be high stress. Our sympathetic nervous system, which helps us to be, deal with stress, was aimed to deal with physical stresses so that we had the energy to run away from something dangerous or to fight for our life if necessary. Now our stress is more emotional stress, and as a result, we tend not to diffuse our stress with physical activity. So not only would physical activity help us with our weight and some of these other things, but it would help us diffuse stress, and that would help keep our blood pressure down. We also have a number of glamorous bad habits. It's glamorous to smoke. It's glamorous to drink. And let's not even talk about the glamour of doing drugs, shall we? All right, let's look at this one. A patient's chart reading, 110 over 75 millimeters of mercury and a 79 uh, beats per minute. The diastolic pressure would be which? The 110, the 79, the 75, or you can't tell. Well, I hope you could tell that the diastolic pressure was the lower number of the blood pressure. This would be the heart rate, and this would be the systolic pressure. Standing quickly after sitting for a while may produce dizziness. This is due to chronic hypertension, atherosclerosis, congestive heart failure, or orthostatic hypotension. This is the hypotension of position, orthostatic hypotension. Congestive heart failure might cause edema in your legs and feet. Atherosclerosis contributes to poor circulation. And chronic hypertension typically has very few symptoms until it's well progressed and done considerable damage to other organs of your body.